All right, welcome to lesson seven, speciation. Uh, this is the, we're almost actually, believe it or not, we're almost done this unit in terms of lessons. I'm gonna try to give a lot of time for you all to work on your research articles over the coming week and a half. So if you do have questions about it, please ask away. I'll be doing my next check-in with you on Friday the 22nd, where I will post another Google form with questions and uh, with, I guess, material slash things for you to reach out to me and talk to me about your research article other than coming to office hours. Um, but otherwise, let's begin where we look at speciation, specifically the concepts of uh, microevolution is going to be one that we talk a little bit about, where it's a, a rapid change that happens in a species uh, or a small group of population. And it's usually natural selection that favors certain traits. Now, recall that a species is an organism that's capable of breeding in nature. Its successful offspring have those traits that are successful, and then those successful traits get passed on. But we haven't really talked about it in a quick terms because all evolution of natural selection that we've looked at happens over a very long period of time over many, many, many generations of that species. But with regards to microevolution and speciation, it's that process that, that can go quite quickly. Um, it can be over many generations, but when we think of many generations, like 10, 15 to 100, uh, it's significantly less than the thousands of thousands of years that we can think of in terms of that natural selection great big process. So natural selection favors those traits in different environments as we've discussed many a times. And it's, it's interesting because we have to now consider the concept of gene pool where when we look at that gene pool, the, the alleles or of that species in a population that are available within that population when they breed, uh, the gene pool is, is a way to kind of look at individuals that reproduce in that population. It's isolated to that specific group or that specific species. So when we look at speciation as a whole and considering the gene pool, uh, you really have to think about the modes with which uh, species reproduce, and we call that mechanisms of reproductive isolation. And this prevents the breeding between different members of different species. And we'll talk about this diagram quite often when we look at the precursor species to cheetahs, lions, jaguars, et cetera, even though they're all of that big cat variety, the key component here is that with the exception of a few, they're not able to reproduce amongst themselves. A lion and a, a black panther, for example, despite being in the similar genus, they're unable to reproduce together. And we'll talk a little bit more about that now. So. There are two different ways with which we will look at this, uh, look at this modes of speciation that prevent other species from reproducing with each other. The first is called prezygotic mechanisms. Prezygotic pre mechanisms uh, inherent in the name. We're looking at that in vitro before the things uh, are, are conceived in vitro. Before that or that species is conceived in vitro, we're looking at methods with which a species prevents that intermingling of other species into its gene pool. So one mechanism that we'll look at is behavioral isolation. They're gonna have different courtship behaviors. Male frogs have a certain mating call that attract females of their own species. You're not gonna see a species of, uh, I don't know, rabbit, for example, be attracted or, or looking for the specific mating call that frogs give off. And, and that's because it sounds, it sounds funny to say out loud, but the key here is that the different species have different types of courtship behavior. It's inherent in that prezygotic pre mechanism, that behavioral isolation. Different species do things differently to attract the mate. And, and that's a, a part that contributes to that difference with among the species in that gene pool. The temporal isolation, temporal in terms of time, different species breed at different times. Flowers, uh, for example, at this time of the year, it's beautiful out, early spring, uh, these flowers tend to reproduce around, there are flowers that tend to reproduce around this time. And that isolates them from species of plants that produce flowers at other times of the year. If you think about um, some uh, coniferous trees, for example, which believe it or not, reproduce towards the beginning of winter because they last, last all year round. Those different species reproduce at different times. And, and as a result of that, their pollen and, and their other means with which that they reproduce are separate from each other. Another one is ecological isolation, where different species use different areas 
um, of where they live to kind of reproduce. One species of bird prefers a high elevation while another thrives at a lower elevation. So they're never going to encounter each other and they're never going to reproduce with each other. Uh, and the last two, the mechanical isolation and gametic isolation. Mechanical isolation is just the, the idea that there are different organisms um, that have different reproductive systems, I guess is the best way to describe it. And so the genitalia do not, they're not compatible with each other. So uh, male and female genitalia are uniquely shaped and they may not be compatible with other species, which will allow them to not reproduce, which keeps those gene pools separate. And then likewise, gametic isolation is those reproductive cells are not very uh, compatible and they won't be able to fuse. And then as a result of that, the sperm and egg of different species are incompatible. And it has a lot to do with chromosome number, has a lot to do with protein structure, but ultimately sperm and egg of different species are incompatible with each other. The second method which we will look at is uh, called post-zygotic mechanisms. And these post-zygotic mechanisms happen after fertilization. So for whatever reason, and, and this is why some similar species, they can kind of successfully mate, but the post-zygotic mechanisms come into play here. And we'll talk a little bit about them now. So zygotic mortality, the organisms can mate. They are quite successful with it. There's no prezygotic mechanisms that stop them, uh, but the zygote dies for one reason or another. Not entirely sure how or why it happened, but it prevents the zygote from going through proper mitosis to form a, a, a fetus. So some examples of this is that goat and sheep, while they can mate because they are very, very similar species, uh, the zygote once fertilized is not viable. It will not go through the process of mitosis. It will not go through the process of creating that offspring. Hybrid inviability, the offspring dies before or during uh, birth or even in their early life, so less than one to two years. So when tigers and leopards cross, uh, they are able to mate again. They, they do successfully fertilize the zygote, but the zygote begins to develop. And as a result of, of several mutations or several incompatibilities, it can lead to an offspring, stillborn, um, or a miscarriage, as well as potentially an offspring that is somewhat successful and viable, i.e. it survives for the first year or two, but due to genetic complications, it will die. And then lastly is uh, the concept of hybrid infertility. The offspring are able to reproduce, or sorry, the offspring are able to uh, come to term, but they are not able to reproduce themselves. So mules are actually sterile hybrid offspring between a horse and a donkey. So anytime you see a mule, it's physically impossible for that mule to pass on its genetic information because they are sterile. Okay, so then there are two key components here with regards to speciation that we haven't really talked about, and that is the idea of geographical separations. So uh, that, is, that geographical separation tends to be what's called allopatric speciation. These two separate species are going to happen as a result of being in two different geographical areas. They're isolated from each other for one reason or another. When they're isolated, they have different environments. When they have different environments, they become different species over a long period of time. This is a very good example of natural selection and how it lends itself to environment shaping the species. Likewise, with regards to that type of speciation, we look at sympatric speciation, where they have two separate species within the same area, but each of those species use different resources found in that habitat. So one example of that is, is if you look at two types of birds that are of the hawk mentality or hawk variety, they tend to utilize similar types of food, but one might hunt exclusively rabbits while one might, uh, while the other one might hunt exclusively smaller birds. They've picked different prey. They have different resources with which they pull on. They never stray into each other's, I guess, resource wells, if you will. And as a result of that, they can occupy the same area, but utilize different resources. And then last example that I'm going to talk about with regards to speciation, last example that I'm going to talk about with regards to speciation is uh, the concept of polyploidy. Uh, in humans, polyploidy is not ideal, and in fact, we will not produce a viable zygote. And in plants, however, polyploidy is advantage. So polyploid organisms cannot breed with their parents uh, because they have the wrong number of chromosomes. But what they have is, is this unique variety to, to be variable within a population. So 
Polyploidy just means that they have more than an expected number of chromosomes. So in our case, we are uh, polyploidy if we have any more than that 2n value, that 2n value being 46. If we were to say, for example, be 4n or 6n or 8n in the case of strawberries, that is referred to as polyploidy. So small strawberries that we see, they tend to be non-polyploid, meaning that they have the normal number of chromosomes for that species. However, in some examples, in some species of plants specifically, a polyploid plant actually grows bigger. And, and in that growing bigger, it's allowed to utilize more resources. And so it does have some beneficial value to that idea of polyploidy. Okay, that's everything for this lesson. If you have questions, please reach out to me. And I hope you're all working on your research article. Like I said, I'll do a check-in on Friday. And hopefully, those of you who have questions or concerns, you can reach out to me before then. But if not before, then for sure on Friday when I send out that Google form. Okay, take care, everyone.